clay is just old, tired rock. And it's the source of all life on Earth. If you've ever wondered where clay comes from, what it actually is, and what makes it special, then this video is for you. Clay is formed when granite is eroded and weathered over millions of years so that the minerals in granite are broken down into fine, flat particles that are able to slide over one another, which forms the plastic, beautiful substance we know as clay. Here's something really cool. If clay is compressed over millions of years, it actually forms a new stone called shale. And shale, compressed for millions of years longer, will form slate. But if you take shale and you grind it into a fine powder, you can actually form a workable clay once again when you mix it with water. Now, there's no shale near where I live in northern Idaho, as far as I know. But if anyone does live near shale and wants to give this a try, I would love to know how it works out. It would be a bit labor intensive, considering you can just dig up usable clay straight from the ground, but it would be a really great science experiment and I would just love to see the process. Some clay bodies are called stoneware and you really are taking clay, which used to be a stone, and when you subject it to these extreme temperatures, you actually turn clay back into a kind of stone. I just love that cycle. The pure theoretical formula for clay is this. It's a molecule composed of layers of alumina, silica, and chemically bonded water. This makes perfect sense because granite is composed primarily of a class of minerals called feldspars. And feldspars in turn are defined by their composition of alumina and silica. Not surprisingly, other rocks that have similar chemical compositions can also be eroded into clay, like basalt. What all of these rocks have in common is that they're all igneous or volcanic rocks, which are formed when magma from a volcano cools. When you fire pottery in a kiln, you're kind of recreating this geologic process of heating up all of these minerals to an extreme temperature and then cooling them to form a kind of stone. In nature, clay is rarely found in a pure composition. It contains all kinds of impurities that will affect the character of the clay that you're working with. And granite, although it's composed mostly of feldspars, contains really significant amounts of quartz, and sand is quartz, as well as mica. That's these shiny, flaky rocks. So it isn't surprising then that you can often find clays that are, have a lot of quartz and mica in them. This clay that I dug here in Idaho is a good example of that. Hopefully you can see some of the shiny flakes of mica in the clay. Micaceous clay is not only beautiful, but it's historically been used to make cookware that can withstand a direct flame. This is because mica doesn't expand and contract at these temperatures like clay does, and it spreads heat well throughout the pot so that the pot put onto a fire or a stovetop won't crack. On a microscopic level, clay is composed of these flat, roughly hexagonal shaped platelets that you can actually see under an electron microscope. These platelets vary in size depending on the actual clay, and in general, the smaller the size of the platelets, the more plastic the clay is. And different clays will have different actual chemical formulas. But every clay is composed of those layers of silica, alumina, and chemically bonded water, just in different ratios and with different structures. The plasticity of a clay body is also affected by how strongly these platelets are attracted to each other. For example, 
Kaolin isn't very plastic because not only are these platelets larger, but they're fairly strongly bonded to each other. On the other hand, something like bentonite is very plastic because the platelets are very small and they're attracted to each other with a relatively weak bond. The water that you add to clay gets in between the platelets and that's what really allows them to slide over one another so easily. Obviously, the chemistry here is much more complex than what I've gone into, but I don't really have the time to go into it in this video. And also, uh, I don't understand it. But if there's actually interest in going deeper into the chemistry of clay, I'd be more than happy to find a real expert to talk to about this and relate that information to all of you. Okay, in the beginning of this video, I said that clay is the source of life on Earth. Here's what I mean by that. In the 1950s, a couple of scientists did some experiments where they tried to recreate the primordial conditions of Earth four billion years ago. So they put some really simple stuff into a glass flask, like ammonia, methane, hydrogen, and water. And then they subjected the flask to extreme heat and cold and electrical charges to simulate lightning. These very simple compounds actually came together to form more complex amino acids. In other words, they recreated the conditions of primordial Earth and more complex stuff actually formed spontaneously. In 2009, a couple of other scientists did a similar experiment, but they added clay to their flask. And what they found was that these simple amino acids that could be formed from these basic components, when they were caught in between microscopic layers of clay, they were actually attracted to each other and they came together to form a structure very similar to RNA. RNA, of course, is very similar to DNA, which is the foundation to all complex life on Earth. The authors of that article say this, the discovery reinforced the suggestion that life may have started in clay-rich muds. How cool is that? The clay that we work with was actually instrumental in beginning life on Earth. The next video in this series will try to take some of this theoretical knowledge and apply it to how we actually work with clay in a practical studio setting. Thanks for watching. I've heard people say kaolin, but this is a word that's borrowed from Mandarin Chinese. And once upon a time, I spoke reasonably fluent Mandarin. And the word in Mandarin is gaoling. And so I sort of have a hard time saying kaolin when it seems pretty easy just to pronounce it kaolin, which is closer to the Mandarin than kaolin. I don't know. Maybe I'm pedantic. You be the judge.